The Resonance Cascade brought through so many interesting but highly dangerous creatures to planet Earth. As the portal storms ravaged the world, areas of the planet once populated by humanity became places of extreme danger to any who attempted to explore them. One of these species became highly territorial and, when left alone, they created many homes that spanned miles under the Earth's surface. However, they also contained unique qualities that other species sought to harvest for their own needs. What was this species? How important were they in the war against the Combine? And why did the Vortigaunt species value them so much? Here, we explore in the lore and story behind the entire antlion species. Many, many years ago, on a planet very far away from Earth, there was a planet home to various species, two of which known were the Vortigaunt and the Antlion. From the stories told by the Vortigaunt, they were the dominant life form on the planet and as such, farmed and harvested the natural resources around them to construct and strengthen their community. One of these resources was the Antlion species. Underground, this vast, intelligent and complex species dug deep and formed many labyrinths of tunnels and caves across the planet. In these large colonies, the antlion thrived, bred and lived in a clear structured class system. The deeper into these colonies, the more important these regions were to the antlion and as a result, the more protective they became against intruders. Currently, five different subspecies of antlion have been discovered, and each one brought something very important to their colony. These were the grub, worker, soldier, guard and guardian. From the perspective of a native of planet Earth, these antlions acted in a very similar manner to ants, insects that also were a part of a hierarchy system followed the orders of a higher class member and worked together to build a large colony. The antlion lived predominantly underground. In these dark regions, they did not require sight and due to this, they were completely blind. To explore their surrounding, these creatures of an average of three to five feet tall instead relied on two main factors of navigation, pheromones and vibrations. Using vibrations, they were able to detect collisions and other creatures around them. With pheromones, they could tell whether an entity around them was an antlion or even tell the rank they placed in their caste system. On the other hand, they could also tell whether it was an unknown entity or intruder in their nest. In the case of an intruder, the antlion all came together to take it out. Deep in the nests, the antlion created nectariums, heavily protected parts of the antlion colonies that spanned for miles and these were home to large hives of antlion larvae. Essentially, the place where the next generation of antlion grew and were later born. Above ground, the Vortigaunt had discovered a very important use of antlion larvae through experimentation. They learned that if they extracted the antlion larvae, they could use it to enhance their connection to a powerful unseen force they called the Vortessence. This force allowed them to pull energy from nothing, heal deep wounds and even manipulate time, just to name a few abilities. In their words, this extract divided the false veils of the Vortessence and as a result, turned them purple and amplified their connection to it. The antlion were very protective of these regions of their nests, so the Vortigaunt looked for a way to enter without harm. Eventually, they manipulated the pheromones of the antlion guard, one of the highest subspecies in the antlion hierarchy, and with these pheromones, they tricked the lowest subspecies into thinking they were in charge. As long as they avoided the other higher members of the caste, they entered the nests, harvested from the nectariums, and essentially formed an endless supply of antlion larvae extract. For an unknown amount of time, the Vortigaunt farmed antlion for their extract and antlion husbandry became an ancestral practice for them. Together, the Vortigaunt and antlion thrived. The colony still grew even with Vortigaunt interference. However, something bad was on its way. Sometime after, the Universal Union, also known as the Combine Empire, discovered this world. 
Just as they had done to countless species on their traversal of the multiverse, the Combine attacked the planet with everything they had with two main goals in mind. The first, to capture the species on the planet so that they could be experimented with to see if they could be adapted into new soldiers or new workers in their armies, and secondly, survey the planet for any resources they could use to strengthen their forces. This war, just like so many others, led to the fall of Vortigaunt society and their connection to the Antlion. Through constant combine reinforcements, the Vortigaunt fell, even with their antlion extract imbued powers. To their luck, both Vortigaunt and antlion discovered a gateway to a passing border world, Zen. With this miraculous interdimensional pathway, they crossed over and left their planet behind. After this moment, this period of antlion history is currently unknown. They lived on Zen and likely formed nests to survive on this dimension of floating islands. Unfortunately, once again, war led to their migration to another planet, planet Earth, after a resonance cascade ripped a hole in space and pulled them through. All over the planet, aggressive portal storms pulled through creatures from Zen onto Earth. Scattered around on a new world, the Antlion had to once again rebuild and create safe regions for them to thrive. The human population attempted to fight back against the constant waves of Zenian arrivals, but each species had to be fought in a different way. Headcrabs took control of the humans, barnacles ate them, Vortigaunt defended themselves against conflict, and the Antlion defended regions they had claimed for themselves as Antlion workers began forming new tunnels. During these portal storms, the Combine also came across Earth and began their own war with the humans and the other species that got in their way. Only a mere seven hours after the Combine waged war with planet Earth, humanity accepted defeat and offered their submission. In their weakened state, the human and Vortigaunt population formed a friendly relationship and followed the orders of their new rulers, the Combine. Out in the open regions of Earth, the territorial antlion wiped out Earth's livestock and pets that would have normally lived peacefully on the coast, farmlands, and various other once habitable regions as they built nests and expanded vastly. Soon, many areas across the planet became extremely dangerous places to explore. The antlion were incredible hunters and relied on the intruders of their land as sources of food for their weaker members. Over the years, Earth became a barren wasteland due to the influx of Xenian flora and fauna. The Combine saw the antlion habitation as pests, just as they saw the other creatures that had come from Zen, and after analysis of them, they developed technology to keep the antlion from important regions, human cities, and strongholds. The Antlion constantly wanted to expand, and these regions were in their way. The Combine learned that the Antlion relied on vibrations to effectively see and navigate their surroundings. To this, they developed and installed a network of resistors, also named thumpers, across the wasteland. These large machines, when active, occasionally slammed into the ground and sent out violent vibrations into the area. As the Antlion used vibrations to explore their surroundings, their ability to detect vibrations was much more sensitive than many other species, and as a result, if they came into close contact with a restrictor, it overwhelmed, blinded, confused, and hurt them. So, the Antlion learned to stay clear of these machines. From an outside perspective, the Antlion were a dangerous territorial species that humanity just needed to stay away from to survive. When looked at and studied, this species were found to be fascinating and fell into five different subspecies. Each one had an important part to play. Deep inside of the twisted, confusing antlion colonies, this species began their life cycle in the Nectarium. It is unknown how this species mated, but what is known is that they started as larvae in blue honeycombs. Over the years, there have been many theories on how they mated. A king, a queen, there was even a resistance member that claimed there was even a mating season. 
Ultimately, it is currently known only by the ant line themselves. Regardless, from here, these grew into grubs. In this early stage of the ant line life cycle, the grubs were essentially helpless and relied on the more developed ant line to protect them and bring them the food they needed to grow. These meals often came in the form of prey that had trespassed on ant line territory. On Earth, this was mostly unfortunate humans who were unable to defend themselves. As small, translucent creatures, they were extremely vulnerable to almost any sort of pressure, and with their fragility in mind, they were kept within the claustrophobic tunnels. Although the ant line were blind, other species noted that the grubs contained a glowing yellow substance inside of them that illuminated the walls around them. The Combine, upon discovery of this yellow substance, experimented with it and learned that it had incredible healing properties. So, they either entered these nests or farmed their own antline grubs to harvest vast quantities of this substance and used it to create health kits for their soldiers. In some cases, they even placed grubs within health kits that, when attached to combine stations, squashed the grubs inside to heal the unit that possessed it. The antline fiercely protected their grubs to the best of their ability. Almost helpless, the grubs did have a trick that at least slightly helped them evade death or even detection. The grubs could produce a strong thread that allowed them to seal off tunnels in their colonies. This was all they could really do to defend themselves against a potential threat. The grubs were and still are one of the most important parts of an ant lion colony. So, the ant lion ranked higher in their caste protected them with their lives. The vast ant lion colonies each consisted of miles and miles of intricate, confusing tunnels. But how were these created so quickly? The ant lion worker subspecies had the natural ability to produce and project a corrosive acid at will. This in turn allowed them to quickly create and expand their nests through most surfaces. Their main function within their caste was to build their colonies. However, they were also effective as a defensive unit if an intruder did enter the colony. The antline workers' acid was extremely corrosive and they knew how to weaponize it. From afar, they were able to project their acid at a target and if successful, they would then take the remains of the intruder to the antline grubs to feed them. The workers mostly attacked from afar and retreated when in close combat, but on occasion, they were also noted to use their claws to swipe. For creatures that moved around quite often, they also shared the odd antline trait of having their back legs at the front of their body and their front legs at the back. Regardless, this did not stop them from moving around efficiently. The maze-like cave systems of these colonies often had steep drops, and the antline workers navigated these easily with their wings. Although this subspecies had created a claustrophobic safe home for the rest of its species, even they could not protect them from all intruders. Just like the rest of its species, the workers were blind and relied on pheromones and vibrations to navigate their environment. Yet, there was a species that had also migrated from Zen that appeared to be the perfect ant lion predator, the barnacle. By nature, the barnacle species formed and grew in clusters on the ceilings of locations. Here, they simply waited for their prey to hit their long, hanging tongues. Upon impact, these tongues wrapped themselves around their victims and pulled them up to a large, gaping mouth with sharp teeth. These creatures did not move until touched, and therefore were undetectable by the various species of antline that moved below them. Therefore, an antline nest became a perfect location for a barnacle to form. Every colony needs hunters and the antline soldier subspecies perfectly filled this role. These were also the most commonly seen of the antline by the population across the wasteland. In Eastern Europe, the wasteland was filled with many antline colonies, one of which was developed deep underground along the coast. The occupation of these colonies made these predominantly sand-based regions extremely dangerous for anyone who attempted to pass them. 
Along the beaches, groups of Antlion soldiers burrowed themselves into the sand and rock and simply waited. Upon the detection of a vibration from above, the soldiers clawed themselves out of their holes and attacked with full force. These ambushes kept their respective colonies safe and even allowed them to supply their prey as food for the rest of the nest inside. As the hunters of the cast, their hard shells mostly protected them from gunfire and general weaponry, and their wings allowed them to fly into the air to evade damage or hunt down their prey if they attempted to escape. Upon close contact, the soldiers made use of their extremely sharp teeth and brutal claws to massacre anything unfortunate enough to have trespassed on their land. These were mostly responsible for sourcing food for their colony, and so they hunted in groups to ensure their prey had a very small chance of escape. The Antline soldier's tactic of ambushing in large groups often caught their prey off guard, even if they had entered the region prepared for battle. For those unable to fight and aware of how the Antline hunted, they did their best to stay off the sand when they passed through this region. Just one footstep on the sand led to a vibration that could end their lives. For some, this worked, but for others, they misjudged a step or a jump and became antlion food in the claustrophobic tunnels below. The territorial nature of the antlion species meant that their regions were mostly unvisited. However, this blind rage that came with protecting their land also sometimes led to their demise. The antlion could not swim, and the Combine and Resistance knew this, so if they could, they made their way to the closest, safe body of water and watched the antlion drown. The Antlion soldiers were and still are extremely terrifying creatures to encounter in the wasteland. Over the years of their occupation of the planet, many great minds and fighters have lost their lives to them and their intelligent hunting practices. With the Antlion soldiers in charge of bringing back food and protecting the entrances of their colonies, the Antlion guards were typically discovered to watch over the outer perimeter and entrances. These, along with the Guardian, were the largest of the Antlion species and stood much taller than the rest of their kind. The Antlion guards were essentially seen as one of the highest in the Antlion hierarchy and as such, they kept order as the grubs, workers and soldiers listened to them. In return, the guard offered help to the workers if an intruder managed to get past the soldiers. The guards were and still are one of the most difficult of the species to take down due to their heavy build and tough carapace that protect them from the majority of man-made weaponry. Alongside this, the Antline Guard were extremely dangerous to encounter in tight spaces as they used their weight and power to charge at a target, using their carapace almost like a battering ram. This subspecies were also noted to have great memories and had a simple but effective tactic if they ever were attacked by a group. They focused on one target at a time as their hard armor protected them taking them down one by one until every threat was neutralized. The Vortigaunts knew how important the Antline Guard were to a colony from their days of Antline farming. With this, they created a procedure in which they extracted the pheromones of a guard by striking a dead one with their Vortessence. With the pheromones available, they converted them into a pod. When used, the Vortigaunt walked freely among the lower-ranked Antline in the hierarchy as they believed them to be of a higher level. While the Ferropod was extremely useful, the ability to take down an Antline Guard was still a dangerous task to perform. This method of accessing Antline Tunnels was not entirely foolproof, as the Ferropods did not have an effect on other Guards or Guardians. Regardless, the Vortigaunt shared their secrets with the other members of the Resistance so that they could work together against the Combine. Much deeper underground in the Antline nests, the toughest of the Antline species was found, the Antline Guardian. These roamed the tunnels and actively searched for intruders. As stated earlier, these held a similar physical resemblance to the Antline Guard. Still, the Guard would never be found this deep in the colonies, and their role in the nest was arguably the most important. 
For each nectarium hive formed in an antline colony, a new antline guardian was assigned to protect it. The larval clusters allowed the birth of new grubs, but entities such as the Vortigaunt and the Combine sought other uses for them. So, the antline guardian's main purpose was to watch over the larvae and eggs. This connection to the nectarium also had an interesting connection to their pheromones. If killed, the antline guardian released an odour that left the larvae unusable for the extraction process that the Vortigaunt used. Therefore, whenever someone or something entered a nest to steal the larvae, they had to avoid the guardian entirely. These deeper regions of the colonies were darker than the rest, so this task became a little easier to detect a guardian, as their skin had bioluminescent qualities that lit up the hallways as they wandered. Although the largest and arguably most dangerous of the antline species, the vast majority of the population of the wasteland would never see an antline guardian, and if they ever did, it would likely be the last thing they ever saw. These antline colonies operated almost perfectly. Each subspecies had a part to play, just like a well-oiled machine. Over the years, the antline constructed more nests as they took over more land. This was a growing problem for the population of the wasteland. However, they could also quite possibly become a great resource for the resistance against the Combine in the future. Approximately 20 years after the initial Combine invasion, the Antline had expanded their nests exponentially. To protect their settlements, the Combine enforced even more thumpers to stop the Antline from swarming these locations. The species wanted to expand and, at points, Antline guards even joined the soldiers. On the coast, the Resistance suddenly had a new fire under them. A scientist that had stopped and survived the Resonance Cascade had made a reappearance after his disappearance almost two decades before. This had turned him into the symbol of revolution and he made it his mission to help in this fight. At one point, the leader of the Resistance was captured by the Combine and sent to a Combine stronghold, Nova Prospect. So, the symbol, Gordon Freeman, ventured the coast to save him. On his way there, Gordon encountered two refugees that warned him not to touch the sand. Unfortunately, these two refugees fell to the Antline soldiers that patiently waited for their next hunt, but Gordon managed to protect himself from the swarms of soldiers that attempted to take him. He even encountered an Antline guard that had come to help out the Antline soldiers. As a man that had learned to adapt and survive in any situation, he fought with and killed the guard. This fight took place very close to a resistance base, and with a dead Antline guard available, one of the Vortigaunt inside struck it with lightning and created a theropod for Gordon to use on his journey. Gordon continued on his path to Nova Prospect and used the Theropod to recruit antlines to his cause. The Combine prison soldiers that defended the prison struggled to fight against the constant swarm of antline, and after Gordon deactivated each thumper around the prison, it was only a matter of time before the rest of the antline came to claim this plot of land for themselves. Weeks after, the Resistance attempted to claim back City 17, and after the success of the Antline in the Battle of Nova Prospect, the Resistance sabotaged the Combine's thumpers across the city. This once again allowed the Antline to burrow and fly in. Over the following hours, the Combine struggled to fight back as their numbers dwindled against the constant swarms of Antline soldier, Antline guard, and the firepower of the Resistance. Once again, the Antline were used as soldiers in a war they were not aware they were even part of. Shortly after, the Combine accepted that they had lost control of the city and instead attempted to evacuate the Antline were an essential force in the Battle of City 17. Who knows how successful the Resistance would have been without them. The Antline species once lived on their own world, and although they were farmed by the Vortigaunt, they mostly lived in harmony. After the Combine Great War, they attempted to create a new home on Zen, and then later, on planet Earth. 
Just like the Vortigaunt, it appeared that the antline could not catch a break from war. The antline occupation, or should I say, infestation, of planet Earth became one of the biggest pest problems that the Combine and mankind had to deal with, with many miles of deep colonies underground. The antline are one of those species that will likely never go away. Regardless of the procedures and technology that the Combine put in place to keep the antline away from important locations, it appears that the Resistance had figured out a key piece in the puzzle to overwhelm this multidimensional dominating force, simply destroy their technology to allow the antline to swarm a location. The antline would get this new location to continue building their colonies, and the Resistance would have another victory of another broken Combine stronghold. Hold. The Antline may be one of the most dangerous and terrifying creatures in the Half-Life universe, and as the war continues to rage on, they are not going anywhere. They had caused so much death to those that had trespassed on their land, but their larval extract did save the life of a key resistance member, Alex Vance, even if it was against their wishes. So, in a way, they did have a positive influence on the world overall. The Antline are pretty interesting in terms of cut content and behind the scenes information. I honestly think that I could make a full deep dive video on just Antline content alone, but for now, I wanted to talk about what I found the most interesting out of the research I found. The structure of the whole antline colony is extremely interesting. We know that they are based on real ant colonies we have here. In the concept stages, the antlines were to be led by antline kings. We even have concept art for them. I would have loved to have seen these above the rank of antline guard or guardian, a true leader. This is also different and alien obviously, to how the ant colony is structured in the real world, as they are more of a matriarchal structure and follow a queen. It is unknown why the ant lion king was removed from the game, but it is interesting regardless. There was a cut wasteland chapter in Half-Life 2 that had Gordon enter the ant lion caves. In here, he would have come up against the ant lion king and some grubs. Again, we do not know why this was taken out, however, this chapter was later reused in episode 2 when we have to enter the caves to find the larval extract to save Alex. There are so many other points of information I could cover, but I think I will dedicate an entire video to it at another point. The Antline are an extremely important part of Half-Life 2 and the later episodes. The Coast chapters of Half-Life 2 may actually be my favourite in the whole series. There are so many memorable moments, from the first interaction of the sand in which we see Laszlo and the other unnamed Resistance members scream not to touch the sand. I tried to save that guy so many times, but it was just not possible. They created so much fear and a great atmosphere in the region attempting to jump from plank to plank to avoid the sand. This level taught us that ant lions were very dangerous, and then when we later acquired the Theropod, it made me feel so powerful using them in the fight in Nova Prospect. The best part about this is that the lore was expanded immensely in episode 2, where we got to see all of the different types of ant lion, and the realisation that the health packs we had used were actually squashed up grubs. This was later expanded and shown in Half-Life Alex, where we saw the squishing in action. The ant lion are great, and I believe they are just as iconic as the head crab. That was everything I had to say really, this was a much longer video than I thought it would be, so if you have made it this far, I owe you a beer. You know the drill by now, if you enjoyed this episode, then hit that big red button, like, share, dislike, and comment on your thoughts on what you liked or disliked. I'd finally like to thank my gold tier patrons and channel members. Jonas, Lewis, Queen Arby, Fluff the Dragon, Chicken Guy 791, Ruben Mendoza, Mosfilet, Duke, Toadnut, Oren X, Azu, Karatana, AJ, Verona, Comfy, and BJ Games. What did you think of this lore? What type of antline is your favourite? And what would you like me to cover next? This is where our story ends. Check back next week for a new one. <laughs>